Okay, um, at this point, you should have read about uh, maybe two-thirds of Confucius, and now I want to do a video uh, about Confucius as student and as teacher. So this is uh, video four of the class. Um, so actually, I want to start by uh, talking about reading Confucius again. Uh, so here's a quote from Zhu Xi, uh, was a he was a 12th century Confucian, so he's writing, Jesus, uh, easily uh, 1,500 years after the death of Confucius, but he's uh, a crucial figure in the history of Confucian thought um, for the way he re-edited and presented Confucius's ideas. <clears throat> but this is, this is his comment on reading um, the ancient ideas, the ideas that were already ancient in his day. Um, he says, there is layer upon layer in the words of the sages. In your reading of them, penetrate deeply. If you simply read what appears on the surface, you will misunderstand. Steep yourselves in the words. Only then will you grasp their meaning. And at another point, he says, in reading, you must look for an opening in the text. Only then will you find the moral principle in it. If you do not see an opening, you'll have, you'll have no way to enter into the text. Once you find an opening, the coherence of the text will naturally become clear. And so what I'm hoping is that by this point in your um, nosing around this book, you have found uh, a way into the text. For me... Um, the way into the text has been thinking about being a student and being a teacher, which is a really huge theme in Confucius. And since I'm a teacher, it resonates with me really naturally. And hopefully, since you're a student, you can begin to get a sense of this as well. So I've got an exercise about um, Confucius's teaching style, and um, I've, uh, we're going to do more about this actually when we get to Plato, because Plato, uh, because Confucius and Socrates are interesting foils. Um, but before I talk about Confucius as a teacher, I want to talk about him as a student, because one of the things he's always doing is he's always discussing his own process of learning, right? Um, and he's always saying, I'm m learning as much as you are. Um, and the other thing is that when you think about what teachers you like, what teachers are good teachers for you, um, a lot of it has to be involve, you know, what are you like as a learner and um, what is it that you're trying to learn? So Confucius presents in, um, this is actually really early on, 2-4, um, his spiritual autobiography. <clears throat> and I asked you to uh, um, compare your biography to his, um, just to get, get a, make 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 what's going on more personal. The image, by the way, is um, Hong Kong action ch star Chow Yun Fat at playing the role of Confucius in a 2010 movie called Confucius. Um, in any case, the master said. At 15, I set my mind on learning. At 30, I took my place in society. At 40, I became free of doubts. At 50, I understood heaven's mandate, Tian Ming. At 60, my ear was attuned. At 70, I could follow my heart's desires without overstepping the bounds of propriety. So uh, Confucius is learning throughout his life and growing. He's describing this process. And it starts out actually with just deciding to be a learner. Um, and when he says, I set my mind on learning, he, he is largely talking about what we would call book learning. Um, his books are different. But you might, maybe you're thinking in your own life about doing the same thing. Uh, not the same thing, but the same kind of thing, but with a different kind of learning. At 30, he takes his place in society. I 
think that means that, you know, he's like started a family, he's got a full-time job, he's settled. Um, this middle part of his life is confusing because he says, at 40, I became free of doubts. And Jesus, at 40, I just had more doubts. I, so it's hard to... But he, as he goes through this process of spiritual evolution, he comes to... Um, well, the word in modern psychology is internalize. Um, we all have an internalized set of values, and what, what values we have internalized vary from person to person, and they, maybe they change over your life. But at some point, you have rules that you live by that you don't need a policeman leaning over your shoulder to enforce, because they're not the law law. They're your own rules, they're, they're, they're the, or they're your own morality. And so what, what happens, finally, is when Confucius reaches the age of 70, he has so internalized his mor moral way, which he believes is the way of heaven, he has internalized the way of heaven so that if he just does what he wants to do most, He's not fighting temptation anymore. He does what he wants to do most, and it's the right thing, because his desires have been attuned to the way of heaven. Um, that's what he was looking for out of education, and I think that's sort of what he wants to impart to his students as well, that level of deep, deep virtue. <clears throat> All right, so now I want to focus on a few comments that he makes about teaching. And to start with, this is one that I had you do an exercise about as well. Um, in 7.8, he says, if I hold up one corner of the problem and a student cannot come back to me with the other three, I will not instruct him again. Actually, let me grab that full quote because that's a good one. The master said, I will not open a door for a mind that is not already striving to understand, nor will I provide words to a tongue that is not already struggling to speak. If I hold up one corner of the problem and the student cannot come back to me with the other three, I will not attempt to instruct him again. So, um, there are a lot of different ways you can interpret this um, as uh, uh, a uh, description of his teaching style, and some of them are negative. I think it's easy enough to read this as um, being about a teacher who will write some students off, and obviously that can't be our style of teaching here at a community college, right? People, uh, we accept all comers, which is not um, actually what's, what, what Confucius did. Um, but there is another way of thinking about this that I think makes it seem clear that this is actually, uh, well, a good idea about teaching. And this is what contemporary teachers call active learning. That is, <sighs> learning has to be a process that the student goes through. As Confucius says, the, the tongue has to be struggling to speak. And then when the teacher gives the tongue words, then they'll take because the tongue is already doing the work. Uh, I think when he talks about the student having to hold up three corners of the problem, what he means is you've got to be doing the work. And this is different than a fairly standard picture of education where, um, well, I'm going to go through a couple different models of it, uh, ways of describing it. but. Uh, where all of education is like what you're doing now, watching a YouTube video where the student is passive and the teacher is talking. And uh, I've, got a, I've got some videos, but for the most part, I, I don't do the kind of teaching where the teacher is talking and the student is listening. That's not active learning. Let me show you a couple other um, teachers, great teachers who believed in active learning. This is Plato, which we'll be reading soon. He says, education isn't what some people declare it to be, namely putting knowledge into souls that lack it. 
like putting sight into blind eyes. Knowledge is, education isn't like me putting something in your head. That might be weird to think about. Here, let me try another one. This is uh, the great Brazilian educator, Paulo Freira. Um, he talks about what he calls the banking model of education versus uh, the, the d d a dialogical model that he uses. In the banking model of education, students are containers or receptacles that are filled by the teacher. You can see that this is um, almost exactly what Plato was talking about. Um, it's like, under this conception of teaching, teaching is just like pouring things into an empty vessel, pouring things into your mind. And the more completely she fills the receptacles, the better a teacher she is. The more meekly the receptacles permit themselves to be filled, the better students they are. This is, this is passive learning, right? Um, and what he wants is something different, active learning, where the student has to be doing the work to well, construct the knowledge for themselves. There's a contemporary thinker, L.D. Fink. Um, um, on, the, on the banking model, which he calls the old paradigm, information is just transferred from faculty to student. And on the new paradigm that he advocates, um, the knowledge is jointly constructed by the student and the faculty. You, you and the teacher work together to create knowledge. And it's got to be your knowledge, right? Um, um, it's not this abstract thing, oh, knowledge out there. It's something in your mind, which means it has to be built by you for your understanding of the world. You have to construct your own way of understanding things, right? So this gets us back to <clears throat> what uh, Confucius says. I will not open the door for a mind that is not already striving to understand. Um, if your knowledge has to be something we do together, um, and if, if you're just being passive and receiving information, like in this video, it doesn't lead to real learning and growth. The student needs to be, as Fink says, an active constructor, a discoverer, a transformer of knowledge. As Plato says, we can go back to Plato said, describes the bad vision of education as being like putting sight into blind eyes. Um, and Plato, for Plato, we'll see this more later, you uh, actually already have sight in you. You just need to be turned to face the light, right? Um, and Plato says this has to be a full body turn. You can't just turn your head. You have to turn your whole body to face the light. And, and this transformation will allow the sight that you already have you, can, you already are a learner. You already are a knower. You just need the right light to, to be able to, to know. Um, to know. Uh, to have knowledge that's yours. All right. So, um, Confucius, as a student was striving to ultimately be a fully virtuous person. He was trying to learn internalized virtue. As a teacher, he makes the student, he, he needs the student to work, to be an active participant in the construction of knowledge. Another interesting thing about Confucius as a teacher is that he is um, flexible. He changes his teaching based on um, the student he's talking to, which is something you can do when you have small class sizes. Let's, here's a story from uh, 1122. Zilu asked, Upon learning something immediately that needs to be done, should you immediately take care of it? The master replied, As long as one's father and elder brothers are still alive, how could one possibly take care of it immediately? That is to say, um, 
if your father and your elder brothers, the people you're supposed to owe filial piety to, are still alive, that's always going to be your first duty. Zi Hua inquired, When Zi Lu asked you whether or not you should immediately take care of something upon learning it, you told him one should not, so long as one's father and elder brothers are alive. When Ran Q asked the same question, however, you told him that you should immediately take care of it. I am confused, and humbly ask to have this explained to me. The master said, Ran Q is overly cautious, so I wish to urge him on. Zi Lu, on the other hand, is impetuous, so I sought to hold him back. Confucius as a teacher is flexible. Um, and this is something you can do, I already said, when you've got small classes, you can get to know people individually and you know actually what they need. Um, uh, but again, this is an example of his understanding of, uh, of what, it, what it means to be a teacher. All right. <clears throat> this is a big point that's going to be contrasted with Socrates and Plato in the next unit. When Confucius wants to know whether his students have learned, he looks at what they do. He looks at their actions. So this is a conversation Confucius has about his favorite pupil, his best student, Yan Wei. Um, I could talk all day with, with Yan Wei without him once disagreeing with me. In this way, he seems a bit stupid. Right? So he wants to be, Confucius thinks, oh, a smart kid would challenge me to show off he's smart. But Yang Wei is even smarter than that. So this is, he goes on to say, and yet when we retire and I observe his private behavior, I see that he is in fact worthy uh, to serve as an illustration of what I have taught. Wei, Wei is not stupid at all. Why, why is he not stupid? Because he can act based on his knowledge. So this is a bit that I'm just labeling Confucian pragmatism. Um, for Confucius, the sign of being able to, that you know something, is being able to do it consistently in practice. If you're a knower, you can be a doer. For Confucius, on, on some level, knowing and acting are the same thing, um, right? The knowledge that he is trying to impart to people is a knowledge that they live. <clears throat> Another interesting one is a relationship between... Um, actually, we'll, we'll make this the last one. Um, relationship between uh, native what he calls native substance and learning. Uh, in, in English, we often just call this the nature-nurture debate. Um, it, is something a matter of your nature, or is it something that's taught? We already saw in Mencius, actually, Mencius is quite clear that humanity, ren, kindness, goodness, is a product of both nature and nurture. You have within you a seed of goodness, and we can tell this because um, if you saw a baby fall into a well, you would be upset. Everyone has the potential to be good, but it must be cultivated. Confucius thinks the same thing about all kinds of knowledge. You've got to have the potential in you, and it has to be cultivated. Okay, so uh, here are a couple more quotes. Uh, this is one you've read already. When native substance overwhelms cultural refinement, the result is a crude rustic. That is, if you just rely on your natural instincts, you, um, well, crude rustic, actually that sounds like a kind of high flutin way of saying a Chinese hillbilly, kind of a peasant. He's being a bit of a, uh, a snob here. Um, Confucius, is a, uh, Confucius is an authoritarian. He believes in a natural hierarchy of people. And so um, a, a common peasant is not going to be a, a, ref, a, a refined person. On the other hand, when cultural refinement overwhelms native substance, 
the result is a foppish pedant. You also don't want to be the kind of aristocrat who doesn't have any authentic connection to nature. Only when culture and nature are perfectly mixed and balanced do you have a gentleman, a junza, a true noble person. He also says that by nature people are similar and they diverge as the result of practice. So we, like, like Mencia says, we have within us the potential to be good, all the seeds of goodness. You just have to be trained. You have to raise them right. All right, so that was my comments on my observations about Confucius as a teacher and a learner. And one of the things I asked you to do for the exercise is go through the book and find your, for yourself examples of Confucius as a teacher and what, what kind of teacher you think he is and how he compares to teachers that you've had in the past because um, that's active learning, right? Um, okay, so that's it for this video.